Hello everyone, welcome to Conscious Life Expo, the 21st Conscious Life Expo. It's great to see you all back and we're so happy to be back and um, meet everyone again and this is such an incredible weekend that we have planned. I hope you can stay the whole time. There's so many things and I know sometimes it's hard to choose which to go to because there's so many great talks. But it's great that you're in Robert Perala's talk. He is someone who I really, as, as they say, walks the walk as well as talks the talk. And he, his talks are so inspirational. And so are his books. His books are The Divine Blueprint and The Divine Architect, The Art of Living and Beyond. And this all started when he was young and he had an extraterrestrial encounter that changed his life. And um, he is now featured in so many different UFO and science conferences all over this country and Canada. And in 1997, he was awarded the Certificate of Congressional Recognition at Stanford University for his humanitarian relief efforts with the United Nations Association. Today, he's going to talk about the visitors, extraterrestrials revealed. Let's give a warm welcome to Robert Prahl. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Thanks for coming, you guys. Uh, starting the weekend off with, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrials, the nature of existence. Uh, I'm a very passionate researcher, author, guy who is curious about the nature of existence, the human element, how we sit in the universe. Uh, how we are sitting in a material world amongst a world that you can't quite see all at the same time, all this happening at the same time. And um, the, today we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of your soul. Um, why, why do uh, the karmic bound souls that come here to the material world to look at uh, the properties of the material world, uh, learn lessons in mastery, etc. Um, all as an adjunct to their studies, all as an adjunct to their research and studies. You're in a long line, in a long uh, lineage of uh, experiences here that are happening. Um, and so you were commissioned here. You might say that you are here by divine appointment, and you are. And so uh, today I, I'm, I'm very honored to, to bring you this kind of work. Uh, I started in this work very early since I was a boy. And uh, when I was a boy, I saw uh, apparitions. Uh, these are men and women, like you and I, who have benefited from greater time and greater knowledge. And in one time, at one point, yes, they lived in the material world, just like us. You can only imagine what it was like in the mid-60s, right around 1966, right? And they would write notes home from, uh, to my parents uh, saying, Robert says he sees people standing behind people or behind the teacher. And this disturbs the class and this kind of thing, right? And so that kind of started it. And I was very, very fortunate that I had a very open-minded uh, mother. My, my mother was uh, into all the esoteric sciences when it was called taboo and it was called the devil's work and this kind of thing, right? And uh, they used to hold seances at our house, right, where these ladies would come over, about 12, 13 ladies, and they'd put their hands underneath the table, trying to raise the table, raise it, come on, come on, you can do it, you know? Or they would uh, be into uh, seances and, and UFOs, and my dad would say things like, come on, what's it all about, Robert? What's it all about, really? First it's, you know, trying to raise the dead, then it's UFOs, you're scaring the family. Why do you have to? Why can't you just be normal? You know? And so, uh, amongst the material plane and the non material plane is, is a network of people. You have, uh, for many of us, if you've had a lost loved one, or worse, even yet, a child that's gone before you, yes, um, you will see them again. They're, when they step from the material world, they step into the perpetual moment. Uh, they're living in, in, in almost a timeless state. While we're going around the sun, are we not? And we're having a day and a night and a week and a month and a year and an aging process. They're in their perpetual moment. Uh, as 
you grow, they grow, and they're never really that far uh, from you. I, I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm also a host this weekend, so I get to host uh, Anita Morjani. I don't know how many of you have read her book, uh, Dying to Be Me. Uh, but that, yeah, I see you've read it, right? Great book. Explains a little bit about that perpetual moment. So let me tell you this. Um, there's a long lineage of, of research I've done in um, the, the mystery schools, uh, personal growth, anecdotes for living, ultra-terrestrials. Uh, there's all kinds of visitors of every single kind. Almost the, the imagination, uh, it doesn't even have room for that. And so I sort of combined a, a, a variety show, as I said, uh, featuring um, my revised edition of Divine Architect to show you a little bit about uh, who and what these visitors might be. So um, let me see if I can, there it goes. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, you. Uh, when I released my first book, The Divine Blueprint, uh, I, I wrote this book uh, in the late 90s, and it did very, very, very well. It opened a lot of doors for me. And what we were contending here, we were trying to understand that there's an actual um, outline by which the soul comes in uh, to learn all these lessons, especially in, in the virtues, uh, tolerance, selflessness, kindness, forgiveness, which is a fantastic thing for my ego because I'm a Leo on the cusp of Virgo. And that one is really difficult, you know. My mind still plays all those games like, look at that guy. And, you know, I just shut up, you know. <laughs> you know? And uh, so, but I've always been curious about uh, pre-birth planning. Now, before you were you, what I've learned is you were light. You don't remember this part. That's okay, most people don't. Um, you were living on the other side and you live in this perpetual moment with many, many, many people that you have seen throughout various incarnations. And you see this mentioned in the Bible, the Gita, the Sanskrit, the Torah, make rough mentions of the cycle or the wheel of life, uh, this, and so on and so forth. And these people that you know, know you very, very well, but at some point the soul takes a choice as an adjunct to its studies and makes an agreement to come into the material world. And when you do come into the world, uh, the material world, they, they kind of say goodbye to you and say we will never be far from you, but you're going to take a field trip into this material plane. And then as the decision is made, that careful calculation of what time zone you're gonna come into what geographical location you're going to come into, what family you're going to come into, is all decided. And then it's time for your departure. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not still on the other side. There's actually a portion of your higher self and another portion of yourself that still exists in the perpetual moment. But you're going to move that spirit, that soul moves into an embryo at some point, and that embryo grows up and then it becomes larger, and then it eventually comes out of the womb and is birthed into the material plane, right? And of course, as we all know, that we eventually grow up and grow older and we grow wiser until we're smart enough to say that everything I just told you isn't true, <laughs> and you'll deny it. And they'll say, well, no, nobody can know about the origin of the soul. Nobody can know that, you know, conservatives have always told you that birth is at the conception. Your first consciousness is at the conception. Of, of your living life, etc. cetera. Um, that's actually, uh, would you be surprised if I told you that you watch yourself being born? Would you be surprised if I told you that you stand there as a spirit and watch yourself come out of the womb? And as that baby grows, day by day, hour by hour, more and more of you is infusing into that physical form until eventually you're all the way over on this side. And this is all you identify with, right? Material plane, mommy, daddy, this is my house, these are my material objects, this is, this is who I am, you're in the I am phase, right? And so that's kind of a, a, um, a little preview. But then what if I told you that the visitors that are visiting Earth are, uh, are a network that is watching this process is a network by which they support this process. Do you know that in the Lost Books of Job, 
Uh, it says, you are descendants of the house of Pleiades and the house of the seven sisters. And it mentions this actually in throughout the Bible, but also, and the King James Version and the Standard Version, but also the, the um, Lost Books of Job, which you have to kind of look for in, in uh, religious style bookstores where they have other books that were, weren't included maybe in the Standard Version. And so I'm a, from what I've seen of all these years, I believe that yes, there is a large contingent of what we come from, which is the Pleiades. And I will explain a little later on in the presentation that I believe that humans are coming from this particular era of space where there is the constellation of the Pleiades. The, this is an area of seven central suns. They say seven central suns, there's actually more, but the major ones are Tigeta, Maya, Era, Electra, Alcyon, Marope. I'm missing one, and you're smiling at me. I, I can't remember the other one. There's two others. Um, anyway, these central, central suns have a, um, a, a, a planetary system that is revolving around Era. And I believe that humans are seeded here from this aspect. And that's not the only place. There's other places. But that's one of the main, I would say, you know, winners of the contest that I think they could be pretty well confirmed. Um, in the old days, we used to see people here like Barbara Marciniak, you know. Remember Barbara Marciniak, Jordan? You know, who would tell you, give you a dissertation on the human experience from their perspective, a full trans channel would tell you, this is how we see humankind coming in here to be birthed into a larger expression, right? And so, I guess I'm gonna have to stand up here. This isn't coming out here very well. Let me see if I can walk across this. I actually prefer to strut the stage and walk around. I didn't get a lot of air mic here today. Oops, hang on, that's my audio. But we are here. So, um, what I'm contending in Divine Architect is, is uh, that framework exactly also, that you ha have this uh, incarnation that is happening here. And we created Divine Architect uh, as a variety show. So I was very fortunate that, that others had supported my work. Uh, so they, got, they actually, um, we paraphrased their contribution, and then they came in and they uh, liked what I had to say and they were at it. So I was very fortunate, Great Brayden of all people supported me. Um, Tony Robbins is in the book. Drenvalo Melchizedek is in the book. John Edward was very kind to me. Daniel Brinkley was the forward. He made the cover. He's right next door. You know, um, he said, "God called me on the telephone." They did. You know, he died for 28 minutes as a world record holder. So let's talk a little bit. So the nature of existence. We're going to look at who we are and uh, where we are, etc. We're going to talk about your direct contact with apparitions, angels, etc. Per my personal experience and uh, present time uh, and opportunity that we have here. So um, I am a contactee. I'm a, a now 67 years old. I'm one of the older speakers now, uh, taking my turn, as I went to the uh, early days uh, of the 80s, seeing all these speakers. So um, on December 27th, 1977, uh, I was in the Lake Tahoe Mountains, and I was taking a ski. I was doing a skiing vacation in the area that's called Heavenly Valley, you know those areas? Where uh, the California and Nevada border meet, great skiing up there. And I, uh, I was sort of just getting into meditation a little bit, kind of a fan of Maharishi and, you know, thoughts are things, you know, and that if you sat still long enough, you might be able to poke a hole in the divine intelligence itself and maybe access what's on the other side and bring it in. Very heady stuff for a 22-year-old, you know? They, th my, my family used to say, did you take something? That's weird, Robert. Did you take something? You know, I took psychedelics a few times. It was like, mm, tremendously exciting. I don't recommend it, but it's, uh, you know, you know, there isn't anybody here on a psychedelic by any chance, is there? I mean, you're not enjoying the show on like uh, peyote buttons or anything, right? Okay, just checking. Not sure. Okay, you never know. Uh, so I was in the mountains, and um, I just simply asked a simple question. You know, if there's anything out there, I'd love to know. If there's anything out there, I'd like to make that connection. I've seen apparitions in my room. I've seen people. I've some, watched their footsteps in their places walking right past me. Uh, I would like to make some kind of contact. Never thinking that, you know, real contact, absolute contact would really happen, even though I would, was raised seeing uh, apparitions, etc. 
In fact, I, uh, I stayed back in the first grade because they thought something, something was wrong with it. Something's wrong with Robert. <laughs> you know, this, this, uh, these ghost-like uh, characters that he talks about. But that's how I learned some of this. And, and so uh, I went to bed and just thought, well, you know, maybe something a year down the road, something will reveal itself, right? Never thinking that in the middle of the night at 2.30 in the morning, the whole entire room illumined and lit up like the sun had touched down. Now, you, you really, your mind doesn't really have room for that, something like that, what I'm describing here. And suddenly it was as though part of the house and the ceiling had dropped away somehow, and what looked like three astronauts literally came down in what looked like spacesuits. Now, I know that that just sounds so far out. You can't imagine when I finally came out of that closet three months later at our cabin. Right. But that, so they, they materialized. I started to scream, and suddenly I was encased in a blue bubble, like a blue cocoon. And suddenly, as I said, part of the house dropped away. There was a swirling tunnel, and I went through this tunnel of light. And uh, I would love to be one of the guys that told you, I went through the light. And it was so beautiful. It was a, actually, that's not this story. Um, it was very painful. I, 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 I could hear my voice as if it was in the distance, screaming. I was a particle point trying to find an anchor for itself. Um, and then suddenly, I wished into some kind of spherical room. There was no furniture. There was no one there to greet me. There was like a glass obelisk-styled object that was there. and. Um, and then somehow I just floated in front of it in this blue bubble. Now that's very difficult to tell people that and have their, you know, get your, your mind around that. But then I went back through this tunnel of light and then I came back into the house. And I was lowered down onto the bed and this arcing storm of violet, uh, a violent storm of speckles, of violet, uh, violet, blue, green, indigo, silver, brilliant speckles. Uh, floating all around uh, me seemed to just close up and it was over. Um, I lied there for the first two hours and it was kind of, I was shaking. I threw, threw up over the side of the bed and I had no idea what had happened. I, I just had no idea what, what was happening. I was nauseous and then I got up and I sort of crawled along the floor and I pulled myself up on this vanity there, and there's a mirror there in the bathroom. And um, I turned on the light, and I was shocked to see that um, I was standing there with, I was, had no clothes on, and I was soaked from head to toe in like a honey or an oil-like substance. And I was sunburned. Um, and, and yeah, I was in a state of shock, right? And um, so I'll speed up the story because there's much more work here, but essentially, I made my way home and I locked myself in my apartment for the first 10 days and I told no one of what I saw. I didn't understand it. I dismissed it. I, I was, at this stage, I'm thinking it's a, a, a manifestation of some kind, that the mind has a way of projecting a scenario like this. But that wouldn't explain the oil-like substance all over me or the, um, the sunburn. Eventually, I made my way to Los Gatos a Metaphysical Bookstore, which was right downtown Los Gatos, California. Some of you might know where this is. And I went into a metaphysical bookstore, and there I thought, well, could this is it possible that this could have something to do, I mean, with an extraterrestrial of some kind? Is that what this might be? So I saw, there it was, Alien Meetings by Brad Steiger. Wow, <laughs> Jordan's not, nodding his head. This takes us way back. It was a classic bestseller, you know? And you had different stories, and one called Angels in Space Suits. I read that and I nearly fell over. I had a magazine, UFO magazine. They're going to hold the first UFO conference of its kind in May of 1978 at the San Francisco Airport Hilton, which is now a parking lot. And it's going to have Dr. J. Allen Hynek. I thought, J. Allen Hynek, oh, who's that? Well, he must be, well, he's the go-to guy. I gotta go. I gotta ask this guy, maybe he knows something about this, you know? And so I opened up the magazine, and there, to my utter, complete, total astonishment, is a photograph of what I saw. How is this even possible? Now, the photograph is missing probably 
85%. You don't see the arcing light. You don't see the incredible storm. You don't see the astronaut. But when I opened up the magazine, that's what I saw. And there was a photograph by Officer Jeff Greenshaw in Faultville, Alabama, October 1973. I could not believe it. That's the astronaut. I saw three of them. They came into the living room and glowed like the sun. Now, you see at the top where the visor is? That I saw no faces. And that I know, I don't know that it ever spoke to me. That little dot at the top, this little dot here, that's an antenna. It's glowed brilliant orange. And that basically, even though it's crude, it was taken uh, four years earlier by Jeff Greenshaw from Falkville, Alabama, the Pascagoula case. And, and then you can see the line in the middle here. That's the fold. It was a poster. Can you imagine that? A poster of my abduction, my abductor. <laughs> that's just too much. And it got even wilder. I went to the uh, UFO, first UFO conference of its kind. So I'm actually one of the oldest guys in the business now, because I was 22 years old, scared to death. I went there with my little cassette recorder. Remember the, our cassette recorder is with a little plastic window? Put the cassette in, close the plastic window, press play and record, right? And I thought this, uh, and so J. Allen Heining was there and he was, he, he liked a steep uh, pipe, he liked to hold the pipe, right? And um, I was having a, a dinner over at J.J. Hurtak and Desiree Hurtak's house a couple weeks ago. And I, I said, I remember, I think you were there, both of you. And, and Desiree seemed to remember it. J.J. couldn't quite remember it. But the, the, there were only 18 of us there that day. There was um, J. Allen Hynek. Um, there was William Shatter from Star Trek, <laughs> Captain Kirk. Can you imagine that? He's standing behind me as I'm telling my story about being in deep space. That's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, and he talks just like himself. He goes, and, and what else happened? I go, you sound just like, you sound just like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so J. Allen was listening to it. Well, what else? And I described this story. So that's how it started. I. And I'm one of the oldest kind of known contactees, there's, but there's, at the end of the day, actually all of you are contactees. There's only, there's, there's a difference kind of between conscious contactee, aware that they've been contacted, and that can vary from I, I, I have a vague memory of it, to I've been completely traumatized and I go into to therapy once a week. <laughs> it can be anything in between. The other was also uh, people that just don't know that they've had contact. You will see this actually somewhat play out in your dream state, which we'll talk about too a little bit here. Because in the dream state, the conscious mind is relaxed. The body's kind of out of the way. Isn't it interesting how nobody really asks more questions about our dreams? It's one third of our life, and we barely ask a question even about the nature of that. And you see an amalgamation of scenarios, do you not? Those amalgamations. I met, um, uh, I'm fairly friendly with uh, James Van Prague. Do you know who he is, James Van Brock? Lovely, yes. lovely, lovely guy. Uh, I'm not real close friends with him, and I wouldn't claim bragging rights. I know James Van Brock. He's such a sweet guy. And I asked him, I said, in the dream state, James, I said, is it that we go out of our body, and we do, and we see a, one scenario is this is a fictitious kind of amalgamation of uh, uh, experiences. Uh, things look out of place, but things look familiar, yes, and you see unusual, weird things, you know, that are strange, out of place. And then there's another place where you recognize very well, right? I said, my question would be, in the amalgamation, that's one where, where the consciousness will sort of add things up so you can continue your learning as your studies. So you learn about emotional response and other things. That's what those dreams are there for. The other one is, I said, the other place, is that a real place? And when we go there, is that a real place? And when we come back, is that place still there? He said, actually, both scenarios are true, in my opinion. Yes, that place is really there. And we talked about the various spheres that you're from. That while you're here anchored in the material world and your soul and spirit are anchored in your physical body, you are in fact also living somewhat simultaneously in other realities. The quantum theory that the soul and the spirit isn't isolated to just this experience, right? So 
kind of kind of far out. So the next photograph, going back to the magazine, the next photograph I saw was this. Well, three were standing in front of me, and four are in this photograph. And this was also taken by the same guy, Jeff Greenshaw. And extraterrestrials have a tendency to walk between the worlds. They have a tendency to be uh, semi-etheric, full torso apparitions, being able to material at will. Uh, and they also are physical people just like you and me that have benefited from greater time and greater knowledge. And why this human experience is happening is, is that areas like the Pleiades and like Sirius are seeding this process. We get sort of dumbed down where we're cut off, not completely, but cut off from all those other realms of existence. But our job is to focus here. You might say you're here by karmic appointment. Yes, I know there's a few that are probably saying, no, 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 there's been a terrible mistake here. You see, these couldn't possibly be my parents. <laughs> you know, this has been, you know, because things seem very unusual and out of place, do they not? But you're here by divine appointment. You are in the great works. You're here in like what's called the ready room. You know, when you're done here, go to contact in the desert. I just talked with Jordan just before we came up here and everything. One of the premier events I would go to is contact in the desert. I did that show seven years in a row, and, and, and you go to Joshua Tree, you are Indian Wells, Renaissance Hotel, you see the best of the best. Um, and so, you know, you should see something like that. So, um, yeah, I came out with my story in, in the late 90s, and yeah, people were writing about it and talking about it and interviewing about it. So I'm very flattered and everything, but my continuance of studying the origin of the soul was continuing. Uh, this photograph has one, maybe one of the largest art <laughs> arguments in it, you know. Uh, some swear that it is true, and I've had other, you know, really respected authors tell me it's real. And I've had said, no, Robert, no, 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 this is not the Roswell crash, this is not, you know, I don't know. You, you want to say something, you know that? Uh, yes? No? Real? No, no comment. No comment? No comment? <laughs> but no comment? <laughs> yeah, you? Is that the one Emory Smith did an autopsy on? No. No, this has been out for a long, long time. And it, I guess I show it because it is a resemblance of what is visiting here. Yes, okay, the gray, green styled characters that are made so famous in motion pictures, television, magazines, t-shirts that say, take me to your dealer. <laughs> this kind of thing, you know, I know. <laughs> I mean, they've entered pop culture, right? And uh, so now you see this. This is my personal feeling on, on the gray aspect, okay? These are um, non-emotional, bug-like styled creatures who have mastered time and space and been able to transcend the incredible distance it would even take to get here. And they are very intelligent. Not all are good, not all are bad. They seem from all the research I've looked and talking to people that say they've had, I had one in the house. On, uh, only briefly, October 14th, 1989. Uh, it appeared in the, the doorway slightly open, and I saw actually that kind of eye, the large eye, and the large head, and it was peeking around the door like that in the middle of the night, and I opened my eyes, and it was pointing a tube at me. And um, I decided, well, either I'm gonna stand here and or sit, lay here and take what's coming to me, or or jump up and take that thing away, or what? and I leapt out of bed, and I heard a BAM! And when I opened up my eyes, I had run full speed into the door and had knocked myself out. <laughs> so, uh, they, they have the ability to appear and disappear at will. This is why people say, well, I think I saw one. But then it was there and then it wasn't there. These are non, very curious characters, non-terrestrial style beings that, um, yeah, they defy the imagination. Uh, the Pentagon, uh, you know, is always a sensational UFO uh, pictures like this. Um, uh, the, the case there of our uh, famous uh, you know, F-18 off of San Diego, the Tic Tac, so many others. Uh, one of the questions that always arises is, okay, so why don't we have the definitive four-color daylight photograph that shows us that this is really happening? Why don't we have the attempted landing in a major metropolitan area? So we, you guys and me, can all race out and say, see, I told you so. 
I told you, it's only a matter of time. Well, my feeling has been this. Um, it would shatter the fabric of the reality here. We're just simply not ready for that. We're very primitive. You ever notice how the photographs are all out of focus? They're all kind of, what's that? They look fake. They look fake. Uh, they're they're um, marginalized. Uh, they're made cartoons-like. They're enhanced. Uh, probably we do have the four color photographs, but I don't think that the Pentagon really wants that out there. You know, Earth culture and people are, are a curious lot. We're, we're really a traumatized race more than anything else. We suffer from trauma. I mean, I, I could tell you that almost any one of my friends could be on the couch next Tuesday. And there, you know, there is the guy, you know what I'm talking about, the guy that sits slightly behind the couch and goes, tell me what's up at all about, Charlotte. Is it trauma? Is it abuse? Is it codependency? Is it narcissism? Is it drug addiction? Did somebody touch you? This goes on all the time. We are really a race that cannot trust itself. We're living in war, pandemic, suspicion, conspiracy. We don't, even the slightest little thing, we have a social outbreak. We have murders constantly, gun violence. I think that ET it wants to make its presence known, but I don't think that, I think it wants to enter into our world for those that are ready at, uh, and ready when they're ready. That doesn't mean that there aren't groups like the groups that you're attending, whether it's Move On or Paradigm Research Group or you know all these other groups that are out there and meetings aren't you know discussing it. The Pentagon is very well aware of, of what's going on. Uh, interestingly, my niece's son took a photograph only last April himself, and he uh, sent it to me. He said, "Hey, Uncle Robert, let me text you this." Uh, he took a picture of a UFO in uh, Boise, Idaho, uh, right there on April 15th last year. And uh, it was over in the sky here, and then we enhanced it right here. This shape is fairly common. What I think I think is interesting about this particular shape also is if you can see it, because this is actually not the biggest screen, but if you can see it, you see this kind of white outline. Can you see a white outline around it a little bit? This field around it, yeah, sure. So there's probably, you know, that and and more. Uh, so they visit here daily because they're seated, they're vested in this experience. They have a lot at stake in this experience. I think uh, some will will. The Bible uh, has said repeatedly over and over about being descendants of the house of Cyrus and the house of Pleiades. Um, and it, and humankind is here by divine appointment. That one guy over here going, what? What? Yes. <coughs> Could be. Um, uh, other photographs like this, um, you know, Yamamu, uh, et cetera, have, have uh, has passed through our own solar system. Uh, and then this is leading us back to what I call the Seven Sisters. This, this area of the Pleiades is located, um, the seven stars, is located in the system of Taurus. And it's 440 light years from Earth. And they're considered hot blue stars, approximately 100 million years old. Years old. Um, and as I said, uh, this is Tageta, Maya, Era, Electra, Halcyon, Baroque. And then you see some others there. But humankind, I think, is coming out of this experience. Um, Another confirm to, to, to jump to a, a slightly adjacent subject, this needs to be mentioned. I, I'm maybe one of the most fortunate people in the world that in two, not only seeing these visitors when I was growing up, and not only having an encounter in December 27th of 1977, but also a, another much more expanded experience 20 years later. 20 years later, I, uh, I, was, I was just writing Divine Blueprint, and I really was just, I was out there speaking. In those days, we used to carry the, the, the big um, carousel slide projectors, you know, and you had to set it up and hope that it worked on the screen and everything. I was just getting started, right? And I was asked to be a part of a trip going to Egypt, 
uh, to lead this group over in Egypt. Now I thought that was fantastic because I'd never been there myself. Why would, you know, but I was offered uh, help to make this trip happen. And in, so in that trip, in the spring of 1997, we boarded a boat in Luxor, uh, Egypt, uh, and there were 40, 47 out of 50 of us got violently ill on the fourth day of the trip. I mean really violently ill, to the point where you're, you know, you get really, really sick where you have to be admitted. I don't know what they did to the food, but I was one of the lucky um, 47 out of 50. And I knew we were all in really tr real trouble. And then the trip had to actually continue. So uh, you can't imagine being on a trip, you're going to go to Dendera, Aswan, you're going to go to Cairo, you're going to go to Egypt, you're going to go down the Nile, and you're heaving and heaving, and everybody looks green, and it's the worst trip in the world, right? And so the goal was to get to the Giza Plateau, and the goal was to go into the Great Pyramid, where uh, you know, the, great, the Great Pyramid, the King's Chamber, the crowning glory, the, the uh, you know, what, what you do at the end of the trip, you'll be able to say, I went into the King's Chamber. Now it's changed. Not a lot of people can go into the King's Chamber. A very different story in those days. You know, if you had a uh, bakshish or whatever, you, know, you, could, you could find your way in, right? And on the last day, uh, uh, I was on my balcony looking right at the pyramids, and I was so sick. I was so green, I was in so much trouble. Uh, and I looked at the pyramid and I thought to myself, I traveled 9,000 miles and I fell 900 yards short. How can I not get into the pyramid? It's right there, I'm too sick to go. And so your peers would say, yeah, Robert, you, know, you can man up, you can do this. You know, so you throw up in the pyramid, you know, that's a story in itself. You know, you'll be able to tell them, hey, I threw up in the Great Pyramid at Giza. You know, well, so I went up there, I saw the King's Chamber, and I came back. But when I came back, um, we finally got a doctor. The plane was due to leave the following day, and we finally got a doctor. Yay, thank you. Um, and he said, you're too sick to leave tomorrow. You need to check yourself immediately into a hospital. I was very fearful of that. An Egyptian hospital, really? Uh, with all my peers and my friends and colleagues leaving tomorrow and Robert Carell is the last one stuck in a hospital. I said, no, thank you. That makes, makes me very nervous thinking about that and everything. He said, well, then I, I'm gonna give you something that'll at least help you. And he gave me an injection. He literally gave me a shot right there. To this day, I don't even know what it was. That's awful, isn't it? You take an injection, you don't even know what it is and everything. So he left. And I passed out, and I went unconscious. And then something happened, and I came out. Of, I came literally, completely out of my body. And um, then I went into what's like you know looked like the universe. I could I had literally a 365 degree panoramic view of the universe. Um, and you're a particle point trying to find an anchor for itself. You don't have any form. But you're you, you have your consciousness. This is why you remember to wake up in the morning. You know, this is why you have your consciousness. You know that scientists only in the last 20 years have probably pretty much proven that your thoughts are not actually going on inside your brain like you think it is. The brain actually is a repository for thoughts, deeds, and action, and history. Your thoughts are actually going on up here. They're actually going on right up above your head. And this is you. And this part steps out, right? And so I went and uh, I came out of my body and then when I came through this sort of silver, like light substance, whatever, I saw my feet, which were in water. Then I saw um, uh, a man standing there and I was on a sand dune somehow. And you know that he appeared to me and he greeted me by name, by my name, right? Uh, and I, I really had thought this, like, oh, oh, I've died somehow, oh no, oh no. That first thought when you realize you've died, oh. <laughs> this one is not easy to get around. I can handle a lot of things but my death. Um, sure enough, he greeted me by name, and then he went like this, 
And he, I know it sounds funny, he has like these tablets that appeared on both arms and they had like what looked like almost ancient Hebrew fire letters and they came out and as they came out, they, a light came out of them and hit me in the forehead and I went into what would be considered like your life review. You see yourself. This is something like this is going to happen to you sooner or later when you see um, what it is, is that you gave in the material world while you were here. How did you do while you had all these experiences? How did you respond? How did you learn lessons in these masteries? Were you here of service? Did you help your fellow brother? Were you part of the problem or were you part of the solution? Because life is set up uh, as um, you know, being part of the solution or being part of the problem. Knowing yourself or not knowing thyself, whatever. And, um, and you know, I'll be honest with you, I'll put myself up front here. Do you know what was at the top of my list? When I looked at it, first the first thing I saw was I could live with myself. That's the pre that was like a common denominator that we all have when we pass over. We'll see some kind of mechanism that's a common denominator to see by which uh, who you are. And the good news was I could live with myself. I said, "This is great. I can live with myself." Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I'm a soul. I'm sort of a mid pack runner. I wasn't an exactly an altered, uh, uh, exalted, what is that? exalted avatar. I wasn't exactly, you know, an angel, but I wasn't, you know, on the real dark side either. I could live with myself. That's what you're going to see when you're on the other side. When, when you pass, you may do that like I did before you die. Uh, it's a healthy uh, compass. It's a moral compass. And then this, the first thing came out on the list at the top of this tablet. Do you know what was on the top of my list? It was a, that he called the iniquities of the spirit, uh, was lust. <laughs> Not the best news. <laughs> really, uh, quite lusty. <laughs> That's not so good. And then came all this, oh, I see, I can't tell the truth. Oh, look at all the marijuana. <laughs> oh, no. Look at all this stuff that I did, but not so bad. Not so bad, really. Then I was taken into a village, and I lived in this village for roughly about three days. And I saw men and women like you and I that simply had passed over. Many of them are fine. They just, that's a point of reference. Some would pass over and don't even, be, death is a great way for an argument to break out. Because there's some people that cross over when they die, and they go, they'll argue with you. I'm sorry, there's going to be a mistake here. You see, I couldn't possibly be dead. I'm talking to you, aren't I? You know, hello? I said, yes, 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 yeah, but it's, you're, you haven't form. You don't have form. Oh, oh, okay. I don't have form. Okay. So, that's a, th there's, there's much that is waiting for you that is so incredible. Oh, my God. There was this wonderful story of, that I heard of this nurse that was taking care of this hospice patients because I've done hospice work throughout my life. That was one of the things I resolved when I got back is I would sit with the dying. My brother, next door, Danian Brinkley. I don't know how many of you know him, Danian. You know, yeah, he's, 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 he's uh, helped me immensely in my career, you know. Um, will tell you this better than I can tell you. Uh, when people die, they, it's, it's a point of reference. Uh, many will say it's impossible. Uh, there's been a mistake. Uh, I, I understand what I'm looking at. I understand what I'm seeing. Uh, and then need to be gently explained to you as to what's happened, that you're not going to go back to form. You've been doing this every night, but this night you're not going back. This isn't a dream. You're, going, you're, you're not going back to your physical form. This is, you've, you've somehow crossed over. And it's, and, oh yeah, the hospice. So this lady was telling this amazing story about how her patient had died and she was across town and the patient uh, suddenly she heard him talking to her inside of her own mind, in, in her own mind, right? And uh, she's wondering, how can this happen? I'm hearing him, and, and he's saying, you can't believe it. You can't believe what I'm seeing. Oh my God, this has been here the whole time. Oh my God, this has been here the whole time. It's so magnificent. I didn't know this was here the whole time. I spent my whole life walking around realizing that this is going on all at the same time. This is so incredibly wonderful. I feel so much better. All of his ailments, everything else were kind of washed away. 
right? And her cell phone rang. And it was her assistant, and she said, you're not going to believe this, but Frank died about six minutes ago. And he was talking to her. So that's what happens to a lot of people when they die. They cross over, and they're completely shocked, surprised, happy, summer angry. It's a little bit of, uh, I always say, uh, all of the above. But mostly important uh, that you have something to really to look forward to, not to look uh, uh, fearful from. All that stuff about, you know, the minister on Sunday when he says, I was raised in that, you know, the pulpit, you know, that guy hit the podium so hard. God. He said, learn or burn. The choice is yours. Is that what you want? To burn in eternal damnation for hundreds of thousands of years and after that eternity? I'm looking at him going, I'm seven years old. I don't even believe that. What's the matter with him? What is this? So, you know, and then people, I have a conservative, lovely guy, who rents my building, right? He's conservative. And he always says, you know, is he born again conservative Christian? And that's good. That's a good thing. That's a, that's a level. That's a stage, right? And he says, so you're into this uh, new age thing, right? I said, I said Randy, uh, which way did you think we were going? <laughs> you know, so, uh, again, uh, I believe you're from the Pleiades. So, let's meet these visitors. Um, they are kin, uh, possibly our ancestors. They've benefited from greater time, greater wisdom. Uh, they look very much like humans, though they can be uh, blue in color or reptilian. Uh, they readily shapeshift. The Bible makes many references to our galactic brother and sisterhood found in the lost books of Job. As I said, you are descendants of the house of Pleiades, the house of Orion, house of Cirrus, you get the picture. You're coming from many, many, many spheres. Um, many people, some lady gave me this, I, oh, I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, we are here trying to access the divine intelligence itself. Many of us uh, are here working on that, are we not? I mean, you showed up here today, right? You showed up here to try to understand the nature of how we can access the divine intelligence. It's a wonderful thing, you know, I was raised as a hippie uh, like in the 60s, could you, could you tell? Uh, when the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, do you remember this? Uh, in 1968, early 1968, the Beatles went to see Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. It's an unprecedented experience, my God. Four of the biggest pop stars in the history of music are going to see this guru in India, in Rishikesh. It's down where the Ganges meets the plains, right? It was where you could go and meditate with Maharishi. He would teach you by being still that you can access that divine intelligence, right? I was hooked. I was 12 years old. I was hooked. Like, wow. Well, people forget that Mike Love was on that trip, Donovan was on that trip, and Mia Farrow was on that trip, and she was married to Frank Sinatra at the time. <laughs> can you imagine what he was thinking of this, right? So, but that whole idea of being able to sit still and access the divine intelligence, it takes time, perseverance, it takes a commitment. I tell people, start out gently, just do three minutes a day. Try to be completely formless and just try to let go of all thought and then ask for what's available and see how it kind of comes into your time. You do this daily, you're going to merge with this intelligence and your guides around you. I know when I hear the guide story, even I'm like that, right? Uh, uh, the guide story. That sounds so woo-woo, even to me, right? Uh, and my family's like, so there's these people that are walking around you, Robert. Okay. So there are those, these guides. I said, yes. I said, but I, you'd be surprised if I told you that not all your thoughts are your own. You're actually sharing the space. In fact, when you hear some things of them talking to you, you hear it in your own mind's voice. It's comforting. It would be awful if you were a woman and suddenly some, you know, dark toned, male styled voice going, Sheila, I need to tell you something. That would be awful, you know? So a lot of times you're sharing the space, you don't even know you are, but you can get used to the idea, get used to practice it. I have these visitations because when I started out as young, seeing apparitions, I got used to the idea. That's why we're here, sort of, to blend that material, non-material plane, and everything. How are we doing on time back there? Um, 
Because I... What's that? 250. Okay, 250. That's Earth time. <laughs> and we're out of here at when? Two, uh, 3 30. And it's 2? 40 minutes. Oh, 250. Well, yeah, a lot of time. Okay, before we go to sleeping and dreaming, um, I didn't finish my story on 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 being on being dead. Um, you know, the hardest part is when we're living in the physical world and we lose somebody, and we're still anchored here, and we've lost somebody. That that's a real negotiation. That's a practice uh, each and every day. It's hard to imagine that if you've lost your, many of us have lost our parents now, that they've actually never quite left us. And they check in on us regularly. That which they are responsible from when they planted the seed that grew up to be you, is they're still responsible for that? It's not like they just go away and that's it. And yeah, you're on your own. You know, sorry, I wouldn't be down there with all those earthlings. Look at the way they think. You know, sorry. And no, they actually walk uh, with you. Um, Anita Morjani's book called Dying to Be Me probably explains a lot. Because when we die, we become fully who we are. And we're not really fully who we are while we're here. Uh, so on and so forth. So let's talk about, let's go back to sleeping and dreaming. So one third of your life, uh, your body is regenerating and experiencing boundlessness. The conscious mind manages daily life. Uh, the pre-conscious mind, memories that can be accessed with divine and little effort. This is because your body is not awake. This is very important uh, that we recognize when we're on the other side, we're kind of boundless. The subconscious mind contains our entire life history. And like I said, it's a repository for uh, all the works that you're doing each and every day. Even as unusual as the dream might seem, it's still a uh, mechanism for your response to experience and to uh, respond to. The collective unconscious, the hidden repository of ideas, symbols, and archetypes uh, deal with major issues of the human condition each and every day. When you sleep, you have contact with visitors. You do. Right now we're in beta. This is when you're fully awake, you're just hearing my thoughts or my voice and you're thinking about what you might do tonight and the fact that your hotel room is maybe too expensive. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, look, Hilton, best prices. Um, uh, but when you fall asleep, you go right from here and you fall through hypnagogic. The hypnagogic state is that state, like when you're on the airplane, you know, and you're sort of nodding off. You know when you're kind of like nodding off and you're half here and half there, you can kind of hear the activity going on, clinking of glasses, etc. But then in, when, you're, when you fall through this state, and this is where you see many of your visitors at night. How many people here have had like you've been half awake, half asleep, and you feel like you see something in the room, even if your eyes are closed? How many have that happen? Yeah, because your the pineal gland is open. You actually are seeing through the forehead, the third eye of the pineal gland. You drop down here uh, almost immediately. That's a very short window when we're just sort of falling asleep. And then you tend, in your first portion of sleep, you tend to go right down into the deep delta. And this is the, what's called also the well of dreams. The well of dreams is where we uh, experience uh, lucid dreaming. Uh, many of us sometimes will have a lucid dream and be absolutely certain that we couldn't be dreaming, testing everything, pitching yourself, tasting something and be certain, how many of you have had this happen? You're not dreaming, only to be startled by the change in location, which is now your bed and your bedroom. This is common, very common. And then you go through theta and the alpha, etc., and then you come back up through hypnagogic. This hypnagogic window, though, is where many people are experiencing what's around them. You see uh, all kinds of them, like creatures. And some of them aren't very pleasant, and some of them are loving, you know. All this stuff you see in the artwork down here in the hall, you probably see any, any number of that depiction, etc. So, I'm going to speed up here, because I think we're going to maybe get out a tiny bit early. There are points in time that the Earth is set up. There are points in time where the Earth is being birthed into a slightly larger expression, right? 
And that larger expression includes your understanding of these visitations, this, this understanding of uh, how you sit in the universe, uh, how you're um, here as a helper in the material world. Most of these near-death experiences talk about you coming here as a helper, simple help, hospice, helping the homeless. We all love it in the movie, don't we? When you see the poor, impoverished, or something like that, and everybody's walking by, and not saying it, I don't, I don't want to deal with them, and then somebody really lifts them up, and we feel that, right? That's very important that we recognize that. This historical significance of the present moments on planet Earth right now is massive. Uh, the collapse of many systems, sound familiar? The collision of ideologies, the acclamation of wealth and power by very few individuals, unstable financial markets, etc. The significance of an emerging intelligence of self-discovering itself within a competitive galactic community. This is going, this is increasing right now. Now many people will say, well, it's, it's due to the sun, it's due to the astrological alignment, the, you, know, you hear this all the time. But essentially, you're actually being sort of pushed forward. Have you, have you noticed how all the, the dark aspects of everyone's character is coming up? Have you noticed the incredible fear that, that's surrounding the globe now? Have you you've had to make very difficult decisions? You've had to decide, even the sensitive subject of COVID, do I, do I take the mRNA or do I not take the mRNA? It's a very personal choice, very personal. And uh, so we have this um, human rights aspect, and all this is happening. But all throughout that, there's this sort of invisible team that's asking you to be the way showers. So asking you to step up. So if this feels a little bit like personal growth, uh, esoteric UFOs meets Tony Robbins, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe so. Uh, many souls, human and alien-like, have been born at this time to help Earth evolve into a more mature expression. Um, and that's, that's basically what this is really all about. They will want to know what you know. Uh, many more people will be coming to you as we have these sightings. We had one just before I walked in. Did anybody just see the news only 30 minutes ago? The object, an object over Alaska was shot out of the sky, not to be confused with the balloon. But this object was shot out of the sky, you know, and so now we have that to deal with. Uh, the Defense Department calls them UAPs. Okay, it's it's maybe it's a UFO, maybe it's not. Maybe it's another balloon. Okay, there are cycles of consciousness as we get closer to wrapping up our little soiree here together. This period of accelerated uh, uh, this this extraordinary acceleration of ascension energy marked by the vast technological and rapid changes to human consciousness. This is where we're at a turning point. Uh, mankind is not very developed as far as um, uh, the maturity and heart uh, uh, to be in its right place, and yet the technological advancement exists on an untold scale. Hence, North Korea and ideologies about what they could do to us or whatever. And so we're at a turning point. Are we ripe for an intervention? Yes. Are we ripe in what they call the ascension or ascending? Yes. Are we ripe for some kind of second coming? Is there going to be a second coming? You know, I don't know. Uh, many will say that it's happening within us. All humanity is now given a powerful choice during this time. We are being asked to be the way showers and the transition team and the ones who make the difference. Many ancient traditions have predicted this time as one of reconnection and reawakening to the divine intelligence. And these, the Vedics describe the great year, 24,000 year cycle, some will say 26,000 year, um, through which human consciousness ascends and descends between divine flow and gross material existence. So we have this sort of divine experience which we want to embrace. And then we're in this sort of dense, gross, very scary material world. So for, for, for many, they feel that they, you have the feeling you want to get it right or you feel this rushing motion, like life is suddenly, for the first time in our lifetime, feeling a little bit finite, instead of just on and on and on and infinite, like it was when we were younger, with the state of nuclear proliferation, what, what have you. All the while, these extraterrestrials are watching the entire scene, flying through our atmosphere daily, every evening. 
They know who everybody is. I believe very strongly they know who everybody is. No one is a tremendous mystery to them. Rapid advances of technology and metaphysics mark this period of one of reawakening to the divine intelligence in harmony with ancient prophecies from periods even higher states of collective consciousness. And so on and so forth. And then while we're in our skies, now what we're seeing all the time is more and more UFO sightings. I wrote something down here that last year, um, officially documented by the Pentagon, last year was 564 known official cases. That's not to say that there isn't a whole bunch more, but the Pentagon gives a yearly number on it at the end of the year. Um, Billy Myers photos. Anybody ever seen this photo? Yeah. Only a few. Well, in my day, when we were you know, doing the first lectures in 1994, they showed us this. Uh, the Billy Meyer photos, the famed Pleiadian aspect. Uh, yeah, the, the jury's out on that. It would be great to say that that's the official one. But and then we have this. And then we have all these rods that have been appearing since 2011. And the other thing that I think that is, that is pretty significant, and let's see if I have it here, is the Pentagon watches daily as these spheres are dropping down into the atmosphere, the lower atmosphere. Right now, we have this happening. Here's Earth, right? And each day, the, the Pentagon uh, looks to see what is coming into uh, the upper atmosphere, the exosphere, the thermosphere the uh, mesosphere, and then finally you get down to the uh, troposphere, this area here, the troposphere. What are these spheres that keep dropping down into our lower atmosphere? You see pictures that are taken by the space shuttle, etc. but we're having an intervention of some kind daily. I believe that we are having a, um, a monitor system of some kind. The ETs are, are monitoring this experience and are dropping down into the troposphere. And, and as I said, we, so we showed these before. Okay? Uh, anybody seen this one? You know, the, the Jack Nedley UFO experience.org. Anybody seen this one before? Yeah? You think it's real? I don't know. I, I can't tell. Yeah. Looks like it's got fire coming in the Yeah. I think it's quite a remarkable photograph. I mean, of all the UFO photos that you can see, in summers, always they're always like blurry, right? Subject to doubt. It looks, looks like the Gulf Breeze ones as well. You know, the Gulf Breeze, remember those UFOs? Yeah. Like, that. like the Gulf Breeze case? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one in Eli Cathedral, United Kingdom, in 2009. Very good photograph for the most part. And finally, in conclusion, um, you are divine architects. Um, I wrote this book. Um, I only have about seven copies with me, but this book came out 20 years ago, and uh, it came out as a successor to Divine Blueprint, the first book, which was a incredible success in its time, if I can boast, uh, do my own little commercial. But, um, the first book was very successful, and then we wanted to write the second book as a uh, kind of a greatest hits package. That's where I said a lot of people supported what I was doing, and they gave us their okay to paraphrase their contribution. So you got a number of other people in here. You'll notice that um, I'll walk through the expo all weekend long, because after I do my lecture, I have eight, uh, eight or oh, nine introductions. Uh, Robert uh, Quicksilver, you can give him a big hand, the producer. Robert Quicksilver, he put this together. Wow, daunting task, 200 lectures, 250 booths, yeah. So he has me come back every year, and uh, he has me doing the introductions. This is where I get to know all these people. I get excited about other people and their work. I'm a big fan, too. It gets worse than that. I'm a Leo on the cusp of Virgo. We're such groupies, just terrible. Anyway, I love all these lovely authors in this book and everything. It's a variety show, uh, a lot of subjects in here, near-death experiences, UFOs the mystery schools, etc. So I got a few here today. But um, our world is rapidly changing and be prepared for anything. You know, we are the way showers, we're the transition team. We're the ones reconnecting humanity with the divine intelligence itself by daily practice of asking for that, 
focusing on that, being aware of that. It's easy to get distracted in the material world, you know, and see all of the darkness and everything. It's another thing to walk with your feet barefoot on the sand or the lawn and just thank God and the creative sources and your guides. That's what they're there for. Thank them. That's what they're there for, to support you. They do support you each and every day. We're living in an unprecedented time of opportunity. Let's fill it with love and consciousness. We have one or two questions before we go. Real quick, yes, ma'am? You didn't finish your story. What's that? You didn't finish your story. Which one? The one about when you were dying? Yeah, OK. <laughs> I get sidetracked. <laughs> I'm 67. I have a deferment. You know, poor memory, arthritis, all kinds of things. Um, when they lived on the other side, it was free. Yeah, thanks. When they lived on the other side, um, it, it's, it's interesting. You see people that you've forgotten about. You, I met people that I, you almost are astonished to say that I've known you. And in this incarnation, in this incarnation, it's almost as though we're recycling. We're recycling, actually. Uh, and many people, when we go to the other side, we see people that aren't here in this world with us, but you'll know them as soon as you get there. You're part of a collective. Another thing was interesting about the other side was, is many souls can go over there and, and uh, reside for an, an amazing amount of what we consider time for rest. They call it rest, right? And you went to rest, rest in peace, they say here. You know, and they can reside over there for a long, long time. Others, almost their life review comes up and there's an opportunity, there's a decision, the soul chooses yes, and believe it or not, they're actually infusing back in the womb and the process is starting almost immediately. Some souls get sent back here almost instantaneously. You wonder where, where are all these dark souls that have trips through history? Where are all these people that brought all this problem in, in Rome, the Third Reich in Germany, uh, the, all these other horrifying uh, places? Where are these souls and everything? It's not that um, some come literally recycle right back in. In fact, if you were seen on the, uh, on the etheric plane, you would see that there is earth and that souls by the thousands are coming, little tiny sparks are going down there to be born and to incarnate towards the seed and the womb and eventually to material. And others are just leaving. So it looks like this all day long. Souls are coming and going. And, uh, and, and, and I would have just always say that uh, be the best soul that you can be. Everyone's counting on us. Everyone, there's a lot of darkness out there and there's a lot of people. The measure of darkness is measured in a uh, lack of uh, awareness, spiritual awareness, understanding, training, commitment. Uh, they're literally hypnotized by the material plane. They literally watch over and over and over the violent TV programs celebrating death as the accepted norm. It's not. It's not. You got a question? Hi. Finish your thought. Oh, so that's. That's basically, well, that's, that, that's basically it. There's a whole host of great lectures here this weekend. You can, you can learn more about the incoming karmic bound souls and everything, yeah. Okay, so two part question. Number one, how long have you known that the Pleiadians have shifted into the Pleiadians? I came to that awareness right around 1994 and uh, I, we used to have trans channels then. That's so subjective, isn't it? You know, uh, but we had trans channels then that were explaining, explaining that um, this whole experience was from. I've seen them, uh, men and women like that materialize in my room in the middle of the night, um, knowing that that's where they came from. So they say that they. No, you know it by by being in their presence. They didn't say we're from the Pleiades. That's such a, that's stuff of the movies. We're from the Pleiades. It sounds, it sounds great. No, by being in the presence of them, I understood what it was. It doesn't last very long. In fact, it can knock you awake. You're so overwhelmed by their presence and recognition, but sometimes you come back into your body. Yeah. And part, wait, part two. Yeah. How did Titania, did Titania's family ever translate that stack of channel writings? OK. 
today. I knew you were going to bring this up. Uh, no, I didn't know I was going to bring this up. Okay, you'll like this. Okay. I'm a student of human anomalies. These are people that stand in between the world. I've always wanted to know, what about the, these people that claim they have contact with the other side? Uh, so, um, is it Jerry? No. JC. JC. Yeah, JC and I have known each other for some time. You can tell, huh? <laughs> JC always comes to these, these, and God bless, you know, JC. So we, there was a, a woman that contacted me one day, she's Russian, and she said, uh, she had her secretary call me, and uh, she spoke in broken English, and she said, we'd like you uh, to come to this office in Sunnyvale. Uh, we know what uh, kind of work you're doing, and, and she would, uh, Tatiana Trofimova would like to speak with you. This is a woman from, uh, from Russia, right? So I got to her office and I said, well, yeah, that's all so nice of you to invite me over and it's some kind of session that you do. Uh, I said, that's very nice. So, so what's going on here? And she said, well, I know that you have visitors and you have, um, you have some men and women in the house, uh, the Pleiadians. These are men and women, yes? I said, yes, yes, I've seen them, yes. And she said, well, um, I, I uh, wanted to discuss some things with you about that. She told me about her and her son. Uh, she told me that she had uh, these beings that like human, like you and I, who took her out of the house, and somehow there's that level between the material world and the non-material world, and somehow they took her to this era, uh, this this place uh, near Era. It's where humans come from, and uh, she resided there for a few days, and she was brought back, and she has an extraordinary ability to look around the body, see the field around the body and then look for things that are disturbances. So you wonder where people get like dementia, you wonder where people get like voices talking to them or, or a, a lot of trauma and, and or they're talking to themselves or whatever. Their field is actually fractured and that then there's fissures in the field itself and then there's even small, um, they look like little amoebas and they attach themselves to the field. And some of this cannot be so good for you some of it is released from your guides, and then some people are learning to be students and let people practice this practice. Uh, uh, etheric body light work. You see a lot of people trying it on here. Some are very good, some I'm not sure, but, and she'd tell, and she'd look around your body and, everything, and take something off it like that, and go, you don't need that. And you, certainly don't, you certainly don't need that, and you don't need that. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I feel much more present. What's interesting was that she, told me about her son, and her son uh, was, uh, has, he goes into a trance, and these beings, called the Pleiadians, talk to him. And uh, he goes into a trance, and he writes, you know how when we write, we write from right to left, and normally with right hand, maybe left-handed, but we normally write from right to left, right? In his trance, he has these people that describe themselves as men and women coming from this aspect, the seven sisters, the Pleiades. And they um, take a hold, he goes into almost a complete sleep, and they take a hold of his left hand, and then he writes this language. And I've seen people do this before. I didn't see him actually do it, but he gave me the writings, and he writes from left to right, whereas, uh, no, he writes from right to left, whereas we usually write right to left. Uh, left to right, and he writes it in reverse. And he writes volumes and stacks, and she showed me, you can see that? She shows me all these writings. They're like, oops, they're like hieroglyphics. And so, uh, he doesn't know what they tell him, he doesn't know what they're telling him, you know? I mean, that makes me nervous. I mean, how, I said, how do we know that this isn't the attack plan <laughs> for us, right? You know. So uh, I've I've always been interested in these human anomalies, people that that do writings and they don't know where it's from. I I ran into a lovely lady last night. I'm going to go see her tomorrow, at 2 p.m. She's doing a workshop here. Don't know too much about her. Uh, she channels, uh, this is Alexandra, she channels this collective consciousness called Golden, uh, uh, called Golden Arrow. You know about her? 
look it up in your program guide. I'm going to see her tomorrow. Because in the early days, I used to be absolutely fantastically involved uh, uh, and, and interested in the trans channels. Yeah. People that allow their body to be taken over and allow something else to speak through them. You know, And uh, that's a very subjective science and everything. I think Barbara Marciniak is still one of the best authors out there who wrote a treatise on the human experience uh, based on the Pleiadians, etc. So I think we've got time for one more question, and maybe we should, we, we should, we should head out. That's, thank you for staying, by the way. I'm humble. Yeah? Would I be able to ask a question? Okay, yeah. two things. Uh, what was the name of the Golden Arrow? Uh, okay, her name is Alexandria. She's on at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Got it. Okay. I met her only last night. I was impressed. 30 years, she's been doing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how I connected with the Pleiadians, uh, um, in the mid-90s when my first book came out, I noticed that there were apparitions in the room. I've always had apparitions. And they were just standing in the room, and sometimes, just by their mere presence, I, I understood where they were from. I didn't always understand what they were saying, but that's a better story, isn't it? They told me to tell you, <laughs> you know, that's a great story. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I knew, I understood them being from the Pleiades. I understood them being um, semi-translucent, full torso apparitions that had the ability to materialize completely at will and not material at will. One thing I did understand was is that you will do this eventually too. Sometimes that, that we're in a long succession and a line for this. Yes? Oh, there's a lovely workshop on that. I want to see that one myself. If you look in the program guide, uh, pets are very much like humans. They pass over. They walk in their etheric body. They live forever, too. They, they go on and on. And do they, you see them again? You do see them again. Uh, yes, according to some of the things I've researched, yes, you see your pet again. That's the, In fact, a lot of times, a lot of people would prefer to see their pet again rather than even a relative, you know, you know, they say our pets are closer to us than our, our own family. Yeah, please don't get upset at that. It's not, I didn't, I didn't invent the system. It just came along with the territory. So we never translated them, we still haven't? No, we still haven't translated them. Okay, so I'll tell you what happened. Um, when COVID came along, there was a big sweep. Uh, in the holistic health field, a lot of practitioners were told that they couldn't do what they were doing. There's a lot of subjectivity in light body work and this kind of thing. But uh, I, I don't know her whole story, but I know the office had to close. I do know that she will do it over the phone. I do know she still activates water. She would activate, hold her hands over the water. Now the reason I think this lady is quite authentic, right? And activate the water, and then you take a jug home. You bring in three gallons, you can take it home, or as many as you can carry, right? There's a lot of embellishment in this group, in, in this whole field. I'm sure some of you will say that about me. Embellishing, really. Why should we believe you so far out? Uh, but I, I believe she's very authentic, very authentic. I think there's a lot of people that are uh, standing in between the worlds, and uh, it's very hard to figure out, very fine line. Are you for real or not for real? That's the subjective science of the human experience, and you decided to enter into it, and God bless you for doing it. Thanks a lot. I want to thank everybody. You can buy a book if you want. I hope to see you around the expo. Okay? And come to the UFO uh, panel on Sunday, 10 a.m. Thanks for coming. Okay. So that writing that you showed there, is that from that lady? Yes. Time? Yes. She's in Northern California, next to me in the Bay Area. Thank you very much. What's your name? Those are Oh, yeah, I met you before. You met Gozi? Yeah, Gozi. I met the disease of Gozi. I met the
Can I have a little one? JC, you can have. Oh, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, it's amazing, all these years, and he hasn't been able to figure it out. Yeah, oh, the speaker's reception is 8 o'clock tonight, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have any different versions? Oh, good. What time did we end at? Huh? Uh, I got, I got, a, I got a copy. Wait, it's 3.20. 3.18? 3.20? Okay, we ended a little early. Did you end up coming back from Egypt the next day once you woke up? Yes, I did. But you never told that part. And I kept breaking my hair. My mom's mom's. I did. I came back and I was in bed for about two weeks. Even in Egypt? No, I made it back to the Bay Area, believe it or not. You just I did get on that night the next day. You did? Uh, it was the worst of worst. Honey, I've done that twice. Oh, really? I did it coming back from Ecuador, and I just did it coming back from Puerto uh, Rico. I had the stomach flu the night before we were leaving, and then we get to the airport, and we find out at 2.30 flight, actually left at 10.30, so we had to wait till 9.45 that night to get on the plane, and then it was like waiting and waiting and waiting, and we didn't get home until 5 in the morning. Yeah. And I had eaten all and day. And you're sick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had eaten all day. Robert, and I have a three year old. TatianaHealingCenter.com. Very good. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. What's your name? I'm Robin. Oh, so hi. Another Robin. Thanks so much. Would you be so kind? And if it's not okay, then that's great. But can I take a picture with you? Yes. You're just like someone I really admire. So. Oh, gosh. And I'm so honored to have met you in your presence. So thank you. That's really nice. Okay, one, two, three, and one more. I would, to, I would love to connect uh, with you um, at some point. Can you do later. me a quick favor? Of course. I, I didn't take any action shots. You two. Um, let's see here. I wanted to just get a picture of me just like I was as if I was doing a, a lecture. Oops. Um, let's do this is a new one here. Just take a picture of me on this. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Can you just take a photograph of me up there? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can just. What's that? Yeah, just take it. One more? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Was it Tatiana? Tatiana Healing Center dot com. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I will revisit you. I have so Robin, many questions. I'm telling you. I have so many questions. Really? I do. I do. Well, so, I'm here right now. I, oh, you know what? I have to let him. Uh, oh no. No, no, no. Not questions now, but in the future, I will reach out to you. Well, I've got my thumb drive, so it's somehow on here. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Thanks, so, Robin. Thank you. Gosh, thank you. Yeah, I think it was something that we should have done. Oh, not die. Oh, gosh. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have to keep watching. I agree. Now I need to go. I don't know where you can go. Oh, hey, Spencer. It, was, it went well. Yes. Yeah. I, I didn't know whether you'd been here, and then it just filled up. Nice. <laughs> yeah, filled up really nicely. So you going to any concerts this year? 
Um, I'm not going to any concerts for as of right now. I have nothing booked. Hey, what's up with but, this uh, huh? This cord should not be up here. It's right up the air wall. That was his. That, that's the HDMI from the guy running the live stream. He set that. He set that down. How long ago? Before everything started. Before it started. He said he didn't have anything long enough to get back to. I'll let it fly for right now, but in the future, or anything like that, you really got to get to record. We're not going up the line because this is trip hazard. Sure. So, no problem. Everything else okay? Everything's good, yeah. Cool. Robert was taken care of. Yeah. Um, I still haven't had a chance to do any of the PowerPoint, so just be apologetic. Sorry, our, our guy's overloaded. He couldn't get things. We're trying to get caught up. Sure. We have a thumb drive now. We'll be happy to help you. Beauty. Beauty. All right. Thanks, Matthew. Hey, buddy, you got it. How many surviving members now? Just Three? Met Keith, just met Keith and um, Ronnie Wood. Uh huh. Charlie's gone. I would have liked to have seen him in the old days when Mick Taylor was in the band. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that more of that 70s period, the early 70s, late 60s, Sticky Fingers, Mixed Out on Main Street, all that period. That would have been great. No. I would have loved to have seen him play in Germany, but although in those days sound systems were boring. <laughs> you know? Well, that worked pretty darn good. That was place. great. It seemed like most everyone stayed. I lost about four or five. I worked out, I, th I think it went yeah, well. That's it for me. So we can now get up and rest and then do some introductions. Great to uh, sit in and listen. I was uh, oh. very uh, invested in yeah. that. Yeah. It, it seemed like I was all over the place. I don't know. I haven't done a lecture for a while now. Because COVID, you know? Sure. When you're in the groove, you do them all the time. You find that groove just like in music. But God, I haven't been doing any lectures. Well, I think it was, I, I think it kind of worked out. You know, you, uh, um, you, were, you were able to bring everything back to where it needed to be. Good. You know what I mean? Like, I, and, and everything had relevancy. It was easy to follow, Good. you know, and, and, and you know, uh, a certain subject or a certain, you know, deal on there would bring up story and, and yeah. delve in it. I think it was, I think it was good. I, like I said, and especially the, uh, the, uh, everything it has to, to deal with, the delving into that, I, I, that's, that's, I'm right there with it. I, uh, I, I enjoyed it. Well, that's really good to hear. Well, I'm in my way. Thanks, Spencer. Absolutely. You have a good one, bud. I'll see you the rest of the weekend, okay? Yes, sir. I'll be around.